Hello, and welcome to the Brooklyn Royals 89th New Social Environment. I'm Nick Bennett, the curatorial assistant here, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC and host today for a conversation with Don Delicat and Parker Daly Garcia from the nonprofit Pen and Brush, along with the incredible artists Lola Flash and Michaela Martello to discuss their work in collaboration with the organization. We are also thrilled to be joined by the poet Fanny Howe here, who will read to close today's program. So a quick introduction for our guest today. Uh, first, we have Dawn Delicat. She is the Associate Executive Director at Pen and & Brush and has been with the institution since 2008. She has facilitated and curated numerous exhibitions and previously managed the Claire Oliver Gallery in New York and Ultraviolet Studio in Chelsea and was an exhibition facilitator at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. She holds a graduate degree in art history with a concentration in museum studies from the City College of New York. We also have with us Parker Daly Garcia, who is the visual arts manager and co-curator at Pen & Brush. She has studied art history, criticism, and museology, having received degrees from Ithaca College, Syracuse University, and the Institute for American Studies in Aison Provence, France. France. She has worked for art fairs such as NADA and Spring Break and has taught coursework at Syracuse University after being awarded a teaching assistantship for academic merit. Now, I don't want to go too far into bios. Uh, I want to mention that Dawn and Parker uh, will be giving a more in-depth introduction to both of the artists with us today, and that would be Lola Flash and Michaela Martello. But I do want to thank you both for being here today. And to quickly say, Lola Flash is a photographer who has uh, utilized the medium to transcend and interrogate gender, sexual, and racial norms for over 30 years. Michaela Martello is a, sorry, is a multidisciplinary artist whose research is influenced by both traditional and contemporary sources characterized by a symbolism that distinguishes her practice and adds a universal language. So very mysterious description there. Uh, so I want to kick off. Speak. Sorry, go on. Lots of art speak. Lots of art speak, but enough of the art speak. Um, I want to start by <clears throat> observing that the title of our conversation today is quite a long one. Uh, the title itself is from isolation to revolution to rebirth and descent. Um, and this, of course, is connected to an upcoming exhibition that Pen and Brush will be having. But to sort of take that piece by piece, I want to first start with isolation. And um, isolation, of course, could be the isolation that women and female presenting people have felt for a very, very long time throughout history. However, there's a very literal connotation to it as we are all here in Zoom. We have all been in our own forms of isolation. So I simply want to ask, well, welcome you, hello, and ask how are you all doing and um, where are you all today? Hi, I'm, uh, I'm home in Newark, New Jersey. <laughs> welcome back. I am on actually on location, on vacation in East Ham, Cape Cod in Massachusetts. Welcome from vacation. Um, I'm upstate New York, uh, between Gardiner and New Poles, and uh, this is my tiny, tiny studio where I've been during the quarantine. Beautiful. Um, hi, Lola. everyone. Thanks for coming. I'm, um, I'm in London at my partner's house doing some work over here. Well, welcome from across the pond, Lola. I know you go back and forth, so... Uh, to give a very quick overview of what we're going to be talking about today, so um, I'm going to give a little bit of a, a, hist a brief, brief history of the organization Pen and & Brush, and this is based on the Artonic profile that is a, a newer section of the Brooklyn Rail where we profile uh, artists' foundations and nonprofits to uh, show the sort of work that they, they've done and that they continue to do uh, going into the future and going into this uh, art world and market that we are in. Um, so I will give a little bit of a slideshow here. I'll, I'll turn the conversation over then to, uh, excuse me, to Don and Parker. And then we are going to look at some works from Lola and from Michaela. So 
Um, I do want to just again say this is a uh, based on an Artonic profile that we'll put a link in the chat to. This was written by a regular rail contributor, Alex A. Jones, and it is a wonderful piece. And Alex is a, an amazing regular writer. So I encourage you to write, read her writing. And I also have to give uh, kudos and props to section editor, Jessica Holmes, who has been running the section very beautifully over the past year or so. So I will do my best to keep this interesting and succinct. Uh, if Catherine, if you don't mind going to the first slide, we are going to do a very quick introduction here. So Pen and Brush is still celebrating its 125th anniversary. That makes it one of the oldest organizations of its kind, not just in New York, but in the country. It's much older than a lot of our beloved institutions, such as MoMA and the Whitney. Um, but I want to give a bit of a, a history of the very, very beginning of the organization. So um, the organization itself was founded in 1894. And a little historical context for you, that was the same year that the May Day riots were happening in Cleveland. It was also the year that Nicholas II of Russia took the throne and became the last emperor of Russia before that revolution. It was also the year that Martha Graham was born. Um, that for me was a little helpful for understanding this moment in time. Um, you're seeing here the first president of the organization, Grace Skeleton Seton Thompson. She was uh, basically the founding president and the, uh, the first person to help the women organize the first group of meetings. Um, it started out as a private club for women, for artists and writers. Uh, simply because they were denied from other organizations, similar organizations, simply because of their gender. Uh, they had their first meeting at the Fifth Avenue Hotel in New York on March 29, 1894. Uh, and I mention that because it's important to know that the organization at the, from the first couple of years was a nomadic organization and it did not really have a headquarters. Um, Grace Thompson herself was a suffragist. She was an author, she traveled the world, and she wrote poetry. And under her leadership, the organization became incorporated as the Pen and Brush Incorporated in 1912, which was eight years before the 19th Amendment was passed and ratified in the United States, which of course granted women the right to vote. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. So the next president, Ida Tarbell, uh, was the president for over 30 years. And Ida Tarbell is quite a famous investigative journalist and writer. And uh, the term of the time was muckraker in that this type of investigative journalism was meant to expose corrupt organizations and institutions. And uh, essentially in the, the sort of ethos of the social reforms of the early 20th century. Ida was an interesting and complicated person. She herself um, was critical at times of the suffragist movement and is a good example that it was a, a complex issue with, with complex people even at that time. So uh, there's some fascinating bits you can read in the Artonic profile regarding that. Um, and the important thing, uh, going to the next slide, under Ida, under her leadership, the organization finally found a headquarters. Uh, you're looking at 16 East 10th Street. This is a brownstone that was formerly owned by Pen and Brush. Uh, they purchased it in 1923 and they resided there for over 20 years. Uh, it was a beloved space for the organization for many, many years. It was described as a mansion with, you know, all of these marble fireplaces and um, a place where the women would, would come together and you know, celebrate holidays and other kinds of celebrations. So it very much was a very warm and important place for this organization for a very long time. Uh, if we can go to the next slide. So this is an interesting slide that I, or image I saw in the Artonic profile that um, I will note comes from the Archives of American Art, where Pen and Brush's records are from their 1894 to 1934 records. Um, and I'm using this image to illustrate some of the important and notable women that were part of the organization. Um, 
specifically here, you can see this uh, sort of sign-in book where, um, or I guess you would call it a guest book, uh, where there's this Art Nouveau little uh, doodle. And if you look at the signature, it's actually Pamela Coleman Smith, the Jamaican British artist and illustrator who is perhaps most famously known for her illustration of the Rider Waite tarot deck, which is still probably one of the most used and purchased and used uh, tarot decks. Um, I can only name a few, but there were many incredible women part of the organization over the years. Two honorary members include two first ladies, such as Eleanor Roosevelt and Edith Wilson, uh, Pulitzer Prize winning authors and poets, such as Marian Moore and Margaret Whitmer, Pearl S. Buck, who received the Nobel Prize in Literature, and many artists, such as the artist and painter, uh, sorry, the painter and muralist, Isabel Whitney, the author and sculptor, Alvina Hoffman, photographers, Clara Ciprell and Jesse Tarbox Beals. And that is, again, just to name a couple. Um, and speaking of this group of women, going to the next image, I would like to stay on this slide for just a moment. Um, and I would like to read a portion, a brief portion of the Artonic profile that I really enjoyed in relation to this image. Um, so Alex writes, in regards to womanhood itself as a complicated nexus of gender, race, and economic class. When I wonder if, suff if suffrage era members might be overwhelmed by transgender rights issues in the United States today, Janice Sands, who is the director and we'll get to a little later, but Janice Sands smiles and refers to an old photograph of the pen and brush Valentine's Day party in 1932. In the black and white image, a festive group of club members and friends is gathered, some in costume and no less than five dressed as men in suits and mustaches. I think this is an amazing photograph. I think it's amazing that it's from 1932. I should say end quote, <laughs> I'm now speaking as me. Uh, so I want to look at this image and I want to ask all four of you today, uh, you know, what does, this, what does this image, as someone connected to Pen and Brush, what does this image mean to you? And I say this in um, kind of myself, look in having read the profile and, and doing a little research about the organization. It's an interesting photograph because it seems to um, hold what the organization has been for a long time. And you could, you could see that as a safe space, sorry, safe space for queer or female presenting people um, but you can also see, you know, maybe the seeds of this expanding and growing inclusivity that, I mean, you can notice, I don't believe there is any person of color in this photograph, um, of course, it being in the 30s. However, you can see uh, an expanding idea of what womanhood means. Um, so I will ask that first question to all of you and please feel free, whoever would like to take that first, um, if you have any remarks on this photograph or any connections to it? Um, well, I first encountered this, um, the actual photo in a frame on the small office at Penn and Rush on East 10th Street back in 2004, when um, my mentorship that became a lifelong mentorship with Janice Sands began. And it was part of a grouping of a, a lot of um, older historic photos of the organization, but many of them were portraits. and compared to this, it was just like, this is fantastic. So enchanting and immediately everything that um, were seeds that I felt and understood from interning at the organization, from Janice and our board members, Nettie Fournay Thomas and Rashida Ismali, uh, Liz Senadella, the diversity that was already um, being sort of enacted for quite a while um, since people like Rashida Ismali, an acclaimed poet, um, and Nettie Fournay Thomas, an incredible artist who are still on our board today, uh, really did a lot of work along with Sarah E. Wright, who I know you're going to mention, um, the writer who is president of Pen and Brush, in terms of becoming allies with diversity in this fight for equity. Um, you know, th those things I was experiencing already in the programming. So in this photo to see kind of that history and the safe space and 
the artistic, like fantastic, eccentric, fun nature of everyone just coming together to be real and be there themselves in this pursuit of society and culture um, just really resonated with me. And at first when I, where I reacted to it, I thought that it was Halloween, you know? And I, I said, is this a Halloween party? Because people are cross-dressing, they're dressing up. And Janice said, no, it's Valentine's Day, which made it even more fantastic for me. Um, so yeah, it, it was, it, it resonates to me as one of those early experiences of understanding the depth of capacity um, for this safe space and equity that we, we are really carrying the torch of building with pen and brush evermore today, so. I mean, I'll, I'll say a little bit, I, for me, it really shows this kind of resistance and this raging that's inside of women because wom womanhood is really complicated. And I think this, this photo really shows this again, resistance to these kind of social constructs that are forced on women that I don't know necessarily that, um, I mean, women really push against them and they, and you can see that here and you can see them exploring them and they, it takes different shapes and different forms. And I think it's just, it's all the way through, you know, we see it today in, in many different ways and, and men do the same thing, but this to me really reinforces that resistance and that, again, that pushback of the, of those, you know, kind of cultural constructs. For sure. I'll, I'll, I'll chime in. Um, you know, since it was in the 30s and that segregation was, was going on here, so that makes sense for the reason why there's no people look, look like me. But uh, as a queer uh, female-centered person, um, it gives me a lot of joy to see these women um, expressing themselves in different ways because, you know, just like Black history, queer history is often dominated by male images. And so uh, I really like it for that fact. Um, and it, it makes me like pen and brush even more. <laughs> <laughs> if that's me possible. Too. <laughs> me too. Okay, uh, well, um, on yeah. top of what has been said, which is really important that, you know, inclusiveness at the core, but what struck me when I first saw this picture, it's the quality of sweetness. There's something related with kindness and exactly what uh, Don was saying, how this could be the perfect shelter. You feel like you want to take refuge in this picture. It's like love because it was shooted on uh, some Valentine, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. For sure. Well, thank you all for that and for your input. And um, you're all touching on things that, you know, I know we're going to continue to talk about and I'm really glad that we are talking about this today. Um, so if we could go to the next image, I have just a few more. So in sort of going through this chronology of uh, the presidents of Pen and Brush, uh, here we have Sarah E. Wright. And Sarah is uh, quite well known for this uh, novel she wrote, the Ch This Child's Gonna Live, that was published in 1969 and was um, centered around a depression era African-American woman struggle, which was not something, which was not a perspective that really received that sort of exposure at that time. Um, although she was at the organization for just one year, uh, she w had a great hand in diversifying the artists that were being exhibited, but also uh, those that were on the board of directors, which I, I'm sure Don can speak to a little bit more. Um, yeah, and even though Sarah yeah. was just president for one short year, she was actually still very ingrained in the, the writers program and the um, programs of African right. descent with Rashida Ismali. Even when I um, came on as an intern in 2004, she was very active and I had the great fortune to meet her and work with her on a few things, so yeah. Uh, her imprint is yes. is, is definitely um, deeply in there as well. Yes, well, so we thank Sarah for her work to make this organization more inclusive. Uh, if we could go to the next slide. This leads us to where we are today. We have Janice Sands, the executive director of Pen and Brush, where she has been in this role since 1998. Um, it's unfortunate Janice couldn't join us today because she's an amazing person. Um, however, there is a, 
a link in the chat I'm going to post, which is the, I believe the NYC arts profile where it's a video that Janice speaks about the organization. So you can kind of get an idea of Janice from that video uh, outside of our talk here. But um, very quickly, Janice, it has quite an incredible past. Um, she was a former clinic director for a Planned Parenthood in the San Fernando Valley during the Roe v. Wade era of the early 70s. She also, over on the West Coast, was a consultant for the Actors Fund, which advocated for health insurance, housing, and many other rights and resources for performers. She did that before moving to uh, New York and to joining Pen and & Brush. And a little bit as I transition now over to Dawn um, to talk about how, as I've given you a lot of history of the 20th century, um, a lot of pen and brush and a lot of the di dynamic things that have been happening are how the organization has moved from the 20th to the 21st century. And that includes, I will say, uh, leaving their beloved uh, townhouse and moving to this more institutional space uh, in the Flatiron District on 22nd Street. Uh, before I turn this over, Don, I just very quickly want to quote something that Janice said in an interview. And I thought it was an important as a, you know, uh, important of her principles as a director. And Janice quoted saying, um, Another constant is gauging whether the organization's program is doing what it's supposed to do and affecting change for the population served. I found that the organization's former home was consuming a large share of its resources without really advancing its, advancing its mission. And I saw my job as strategizing how to correct that. I think an executive director's job is to keep focus on the big picture. So with that sort of big picture in mind, uh, I will turn this over now to you, Dawn, to kind of talk about that transition and how that big picture has expanded even more into some of the programming you've done over the few years and what's what's coming up. Yes, absolutely. So um, jumping off from what Janice um, so clearly said there, our work became to dig into how do we look at the history of why this organization was started the community and safe space and openness that they built, how, how do we maintain that and protect that, but really take it to the next professionalized, if you will, level of how to move artists and writers forward in the 21st century market-based constructs of how artists' voices get heard and supported and picked up by the primary market, escalate in value onto the secondary market and get sort of into that wheel that um, allows them to ultimately be collected by collectors who bequest to museums or by museums themselves so that we are really working from the, the very beginning of like a zygote level of how you move an artist forward to the ultimate goal of changing culture so that when a child walks into a museum, they are regularly seeing our humanity reflected for posterity through the eyes of women, through black women, through black queer women, anyone who has been written out and kept out of access from this uh, patriarchal system that we've been dealt. So that really became how we strategized and and Janice coming from the advocacy deep background that you mentioned of being like uh, so socially service minded and and the idea that you know we, we need to have market based equity so these artists can eat and especially as women you know if they are have their art they have their day job that pays the bills if they so choose to rear children as well. We all know that three things to carry is too many and the art falls away. So for many years, Janice was meeting these women after the kids went off to college and just seeing massive resumes of like jury shows, residencies, but you know, not really being able to dig into their art and even put the time into to stay true to their authentic voice or reflecting our society for any real change. So then it became easy for the systems to write them out, right? Because the weight of earning a living and rearing children became way too much 
um, to, to keep at their art and, and dug into everything that that really takes for an artist. Um, which is why we have two great examples here in Lola Flash and Michaela Martello, who have stayed the course decade after decade after decade, no matter what, creating their art with their feet on the ground, very much dug into our society and responding to our world as, as, as we value artists' voices for that reason, right? So that became um, the challenge to figure out how do we sort of take the system that exists and look at how commercial galleries productively grow, mentor, and support artists' voices and move them forward and find primary market-based equity to help sustain them. And at, at the same time, you know, create that community, you know, have a merit-based vetting system so that it's serious professional artists that we're taking our best shot with, but we're also allowing room for that safe space and alternate community and, you know, giving them opportunities that they've never been given so that their art and their voice can grow. So that's really the program we launched with in, in the new space. And this is an image of it. Um, we opened up accepting entries in 2014, which is um, a little anecdote. We took ads in the Brooklyn Rail and Michaela Martello, who is here with us today, responded to our ad in the rail, which is how we met. And um, incidentally, she was curated into our first exhibition, which Lola Flash was at. We did not get to meet that day, but she was at our opening exhibition. So um, it's just, it's, to me, it's a great story of like attracting like and how Fong Bui always um, ends his writings with in solidarity. Um, I, I feel like we started to hit on that right pressure point and track of uh, what we were going for as a serious professional organization that strategically was, was putting tentacles into the field at all points, but also very open, right? Usually the pretensions of some of the New York art world, like openness and high level of professionalism and exhibition space, they don't, they're, they're, uh, they conflict, you know? So it was, it was really um, a balancing act of all those things and figuring out how to garner the resources to do it, um, that we open the new space. And if you wanna go to, I think the next slide. Okay, so that's our literary program. Um, I know we have two artists here today, but um, the pen part of what we do, we also launched a biannual imprint publication for the first time. Caitlin is on here, Dawn. She's in, the, she's in the Zoom, Caitlin, who was published in it. Oh, fantastic. One of our artists, who's also a writer, Caitlin Copenhaver, um, is published oh. in one of our editions and um, is on the Zoom. So yeah, we do have quite a few Renaissance um, artists who are writers as well. So um, yes, launching uh, a new form of the pen side of what we do at Pen and Brush to support the writers in an equal way so that um, you know the next great American novel is not just assumed to always be by a white male, that there's um, you know female voices, diverse voices coming in, uh, really all the same goals that we've hit on on the art side, but with very different strategies, of course, that apply to the public publishing landscape is what we've been um, working on and trying to do on the imprint side. So um, I know that the there's gonna be a link in the chat. You can read some previews of, of pen and brush imprint on our website that have been edited by Elizabeth Redfield. And you can also order them and buy them and stay tuned for uh, new programming coming up in the fall uh, post COVID. <laughs> And I just want to echo a couple of things that Dawn said was that when we relaunched, uh, uh, Dawn and Janice spent a lot of time talking about this kind of thought leadership, but also how Pen and Brush could really serve the purpose that it's mission, because we're a mission oriented organization, as Dawn said. So I think as someone who came in later, looking at what Dawn and Janice had kind of laid down and, and the way that we were going to go about doing things was we really looked at society and looked at the shortcomings of the art world. We looked at the shortcomings of the way that women, especially after they had had kids or um, if they had to take a break for any reason, because, you know, those resume gaps that were often for very practical life reasons, you know, and women, um, you know, somebody, I think um, Lori Simmons told a story or someone in an in a, um, article I read recently that was saying how after she had a child, she went to an opening for one of um, 
their, her shows and so people kept coming up to her and saying, I know you've just been doing so much. You've just been doing a lot. You know, so society really does, even if you're still active, it does kind of impose these things on you. So I think Pen and Brush really looked at what's going on, what can we do, how do we fill that space for, for legitimate women artists that are really, really have a strong voice. And also Pen and Brush really, Dawn and Janice really tried to make sure that it was um, programming and uh, a mission oriented program that was going to appeal to artists that had this very focused voice. So not people right out of school, but people who had been trying and who had the system had been letting down. So, and Michaela and Lola, even just being in that same space on our, our opening day, opening show in 2015, that shows that that really did work. And it was so thoughtful and just learning about it as I was hired and, and re being read in was so incredible. Um, so I just wanted to echo that. But also I think another thing about Pen and Brush that's this new kind of, I guess, relaunch, if you will, is accessibility was a major thing and uh, and also being able to um, approachability was a big thing so that artists felt comfortable coming in and asking us questions and felt comfortable showing us new work even if they weren't quite sure about it yet that we wouldn't you know um, there wasn't a system where we were like oh god let me get a step back you know that we really made sure that it was a space that people could come in and ask questions um, but also that it was a serious artist space too so putting forth museum quality shows um, okay. <laughs> well, thank you both. I mean, the, the, the whole emphasis of equity is so important. And I think we'll probably get to that in a way where, you know, what originally was something, you know, an organization made or started by women because they were shut out because of their gender, um, that itself has evolved over time in that, you know, this sense of equity is just simply no person should be, uh, their work should be judged because of the gender of the, of the maker. Um, just about the art. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so having a look at time though, I think it is prime to just jump right into some of the art and to get Lola and to get Michaela here. Um, I'll let you both lead the way. All right, so I'm tackling Lola, which you can see behind me. I should have picked a different um, image. <laughs> but, um, so Lola Flash is such an important artist for um, so many reasons, but Lola uses photography, as Nick said, to challenge and to, I think, really normalize queer, black, brown, and non-binary bodies, um, which is really lovely. Lola's been doing that since at least the 1980s, probably much before then. Um, and Lola's work really does transcend kind of current constructs of what gender is. And it interrogates and confronts, as Nick said, um, sexual, racial, and gender norms. Um, Lola mainly works in four by five film um, camera and in portraiture. Um, and uh, she's been an important voice in photography, like I said, since the 1980s, coming up with some really, you know, like Nan Golden coming up at the same time as a lot of people who have had a lot of success. and work saying a lot of voice with a voice that's very strong that's just as strong as a lot of those artists who have seen success so when we um encountered lola's work we were looking at lola's work um during the aids crisis and it was so raw and so amazing that we just couldn't believe we were just gobsmacked um lola's also been at the forefront of act up and um you might know uh lola's face from that really famous um uh, it was on the side of buses in New York City, and it was the kissing doesn't kill and greed and indifference to um, photograph, which I think um, you can, it's by Grand Fury Lulz, I think. Grand Fury put it out, and the silence equals death. Um, and she was also in um, that new museum exhibition that was really important as well. Um, Lola has work in the Victoria and Albert Museum and also in the Brooklyn Museum, important public collections. Um, she was also featured in um, Posing Beauty, which is a amazing publication edited by Deb Willis and um, is uh, part of the Kamanji Collective and on the board of Queer Arts where she's been a mentor since 2000, 2019. Um, Lola's work has evolved um, as you can see in the photo behind me and in the photo in the uh, slide. You can see on the left I believe the cross color series which is the, the earlier work um, and then on the right that is is that surpassing Lola's so yes. Captain, yeah. which is one of my favorite series that Lola does. Um, I'm gonna let you take it from there, um, Lola, but yeah. Okay. Well, it seems like you said everything. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. 
So yeah, this was, um, this is from my, my big solo show at Pen and Brush, which really kind of, um, kind of sh almost like a canon, kind of shot me out of this canon. And um, I sort of became uh, visible to the world. Um, you know, I guess for us New Yorkers, you know, being written up in the New York Times, it's like, you know, you feel like you've made it. And um, so I had a really nice write up with a bunch of amazing images, um, probably like maybe 10 images or more and really nice type to go along with it. Um, for anyone who hasn't been to the space at Pen and Brush, uh, they gave me both floors. So there's a lower level and this is the main level. Um, so for me as an artist, you know, we as Dawn and Parker know, a, a lot of us, especially those of us who are doing analog work. Um, so the work is not stored on your computer. It's often stored under your bed. Um, and so I had a lot of this work under my bed. And um, for me, to be honest with you, I never really, uh, you know, I've said it before and I'll say it again. It's like my purpose in, in life as an artist was really uh, to make my models feel seen. So for the hour and a half that I spend with them taking their portrait, um, they can think about how beautiful they are. So maybe coming to, you know, wherever I, they came from or leaving, you know, they might run into racism um, as most of us do um, and many of us on a daily basis. But for that little chunk of time, they're with Lola Flesh and they're thinking about how beautiful they are, you know, and they're giving me that, their beauty. Um, and so really, I, 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 for most of my life, I was really just happy showing my work in pubs, um, restaurants, places where people who look like me go. Um, I think that museums are working towards, especially like someplace like the Brooklyn Museum, are working towards bringing the community inside, uh, which is really amazing um, to me because initially I felt that the audience I was looking for was not a white straight audience. You know, that's not the people who I was, make, was making the work for. Right. But after seeing this um, Carrie James Marshall show at the, um, at the Met Brower and seeing the, um, the reactions to it, the people crying, you know, and it was, I really, I was kind of like, here I'm at, I mean, Met was like probably the last place I ever thought about to exhibit my work. But to see the reaction of the crowd, I thought to myself, hmm, maybe these people do need to see my work, you know? So that kind of all just, that kind of thinking just kind of changed within the last couple of years for me. Um, yeah. So yeah, you want to go to another slide. So these are, this is from my salt series. So at the lower level, uh, there were images, 21 images from my salt series, which is women who are over 70. And that's, um, my buddy, Tony Parks, who passed away several years ago and Agnes Gunn. So it's, it's, again, it's showing that even though they're over 70, they still have this beauty and this sense of pride. So Lola, we should mention, Lola has um, some really distinct series. So this is Salt. Um, in the slides before, we saw some of the surpassing and some of the surmise series. So I think it would also be interesting, Lola, quickly, if, because um, I, I like this quote that uh, your friend Renee Misai had, had at the beginning of uh, writing that we had in the catalog, and it says, photography, Black, African, homosexual photography, which I must not use just as an instrument, but as a weapon if I am to resist attacks on my integrity and indeed my existence on my own terms. And I remember digging through some of the work that we were going to show um, and just talking about how you were, you know, maybe perhaps too, you felt too light skinned for this, to join this collective and too dark skinned for this and not quite black enough for this and not quite that. And being that kind of not really seeing yourself represented. And I think um, in your surmise and surpassing series that really touches on that in a really personal way for you, but also in a way that I think really connects to what's going on right now um, socially. Yeah, I mean, for sure. If, if we can keep going, um, this is salt. But yeah, I mean, it's interesting because now I'm doing this self-portrait series, which I'll show in a bit. Um, but I've always said that my models are like a piece of me, you know, almost thinking about it almost like a quilt or a mosaic. Um, 
And so it is very much about me and my experiences. And, you know, sometimes it can be kind of brutal like this case for KKK, um, which is part of an alphabet series I did, um, or, you know, sort of something tender where these two girls are, are kissing. And then the further one down is for Ray. Um, and this is a style I did for about 20 years straight out of college where I was reversing the color, um, kind of pushing back against the idea that black is bad and white is good in right. a nutshell. Different bodies appear in different colors, which is really subverting, but also the meaning is still there and you tend to democratize the image in a way, which is, again, I think really important. Thank you. Always. <laughs> Can we keep going? So this is Surmise. This is my buddy Utah. I call Utah my little brother. And um, so this is all about, like uh, Parker was saying, you know, I, I'm constantly misgendered. And um, it feels to me like in the 21st century that really we should have kind of gone past those kinds of ideas. You know, someone with long hair as a girl, someone with short hair as a guy. It's just, I mean, even in the straight community, straight women have short hair, you know, so it's not really, it used to be an indicator of if you were, if you were gay, um, but I, I think that we've gone a lot further than that. Um, so that's what that series is about. Um, so here comes some more from this series. Um, part of, also part of my work, especially um, in this series and surpassing is about the gays. Um, because as many of you know, I'm sure that you're joining us because you're probably hip to a lot of what's going on out there. Um, but the reason why my models are looking at the viewer is because, you know, back in the day when my grandparents were around, you could be killed for looking straight in the eye of a, of a white person. You know, Emmett Till is a perfect example of, of that. And so for me, it's like, uh, you know, it's, it's almost like an act of, act of revolution to be looking straight out. So that's really important for me. Also, we, when we installed the show, Lola asked that we hang these um, two inches above eyesight, which is typically in, the, in a museum or a gallery, it's like 59 inches. We ended up hanging them a little bit higher just because of the size of some of them. And Lola asked that, which, why don't you say it, Lola? Why? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, the reason why the reason why yeah the reason why so that they're that the audience is looking up at my you know majestic Shakespearean you know uh, models. Yeah. And I just want to add to I, I I think it's so incredible and so important as we were kind of considering that that concept of womanhood and how it has expanded and it's it's so wonderful to see these gender fluid and these queer bodies in the space. So I, I just wanna thank you for the work that you make, Lola. <laughs> and thank you, Pen and Brush, for exhi exhibiting it. And having Thanks. them large in that way was just really powerful and moving and, and really just so normal. You were like, how could they ever be minimized ever? I mean, it was, it was yeah. a lovely show. We missed, when we took it down, Dawn, oh my God, how sad were we? <laughs> Yeah, deinstall de day for anybody who works in the art world is usually a pretty sad day. <laughs> um, I just wanted to add in terms of what we were talking about before with uh, the strategy that Janice and I had come up with when we um, finally actually met Lola and went for our studio visit with her, which was about two years before this show took place. Um, seeing the body of work, the depth, the breadth, how she had those early cross colors where she learned to, to take the medium of photography and use a chemical process to just enact in the viewer messing with black and white skin, right? Like this realization that photography could be a, a social revolution tool for her as an artist. And you see that come into this very beautiful, refined four by five portraiture but e even though they're aesthetically very different on the output, what she's doing with her fingerprint as an artist is the same. It's really confronting the viewer by utilizing every tool as an artist and a photographer and as a seer and as a Black queer artist specifically, that you're, you're, you're hitting the viewer with so something that is confrontational and beautiful and with character and undeniable. And at such a high level, I mean, that's why Pen and Brush 
still exist and has to exist <laughs> because of artists like this literally having beautiful work like this under her bed. I mean, it's, it's just beyond. So um, I remember that Janice and I were standing outside of Lola's studio and this strategy that we had worked on for years and years and constantly um, learning from. And even when we opened in the new space, uh, we had opened in 2015, Lola's show did not take place till 2018. Every moment of tension that we had learned from in how to move an artist forward productively. Um, once, once we encountered Lola, we said, if we cannot move Lola forward, this strategy does not work. And boy, did it work. So, <laughs> you know, L Lola had done all the work for 30 years and stayed rooted and authentic and dug into her craft and paying attention to the world and creating from that space. And what we had to do as an institution and Parker and I as curators, I always say to Lola is run it over home plate because you, you did all the work. We just, we, we had to be the construct to just say, stand on our shoulders. We're going to do this together. The world needs to hear your voice. And, and that's what it's all about at the end of the day. So thank you, Lola. Thank you. It's been <laughs> One more thing before we move on is I just want to touch on Lola, the surpassing series. I think it's important because that is something that I haven't seen outside of, of your work. And it's the, um, and remember you said how you wanted to ideally your best case scenario would be to install in the Guggenheim and have to subvert it and have the color going. And so I wish you could, I hope you can explain that. I would love it if you could explain um, the surpassing series just quickly before we move on. Okay, so the surpassing series, it actually started when I was here in London because uh, everyone used to always say, hi, this is, um, uh, this is Lola, they'd introduce me and say, this is Lola and she's a mixed race girl. And I'd always, you know, kind of stamp my foot and say, I'm not mixed race, you know, because African-Americans who look like me, we just know because it's because of slavery, right? It's not because um, a happily in love couple that happened to be black and white, you know, create this beautiful child. And um, after, I guess, probably like the 15th or 16th time I stamped my foot, I thought to myself, you know, like they say, but you are Blanche, you are, you know, and I, I thought to myself, yeah, you know, I've just sort of been denying this white blood and I kind of, so that's where it kind of came from. And I, you know, I decided to make it into a love story that my grandmother, because I know there was a lot of rape, um, but I decided that my great, great grandmother had a torrid affair with the master. Um, and so that's how, you know, the white blood got into me. So being light skinned, growing up, um, it is, uh, it, it was challenging for me because people always were saying, and even, uh, you know, it, even people from my own community were saying, you know, I wasn't black enough. Um, my grandmother would pass and I remember her passing, but I never really thought about how me being light skinned maybe made my road a little bit easier. You know, I, I didn't really sort of walk in like I'm the light skinned girl, you know what I mean? I just, I didn't really, that was just me. Um, so I started this series about it. And I think for me, I, I know not for all artists, but for me, art's very uh, cathartic. And I thought, well, if I can make some beautiful images about this and show the beauty and people that are my skin color all the way down to people who are like my dad's color, you know, that I could show that we're all the same. And it has a kind of like this universal um, element to it because, you know, Indian people have that in their culture. Greek people have it in their culture. There's lots of different cultures that have this kind of skin thing, Cuban culture. Um, so the idea is to shoot these uh, these light skinned people to dark skinned people. And then when, I, when I'm finished, um, I'm going to, I would like to display it at the, at the Whitney. Cause I always thought, you know, cause it's like a spectrum. So I always thought, where, where can I show this where I can actually really show what I'm talking about? And as soon as I went to watch into Whitney, I was like, that's where it should be. So I want to have the light skin portrait starting off at the bottom and then twirling all the way up to the dark skin portraits so that you're I'm visually saying that dark is better than, than light. So I'm kind of, I guess, leveling the playing field in a certain way or just kind of double, it's like a double entendre, entendre in, a, in a sense. So that's what that series is about, yes. So just to interject a correction, it's the Guggenheim because you want to go on the rotunda. Not the what did I say? You said the Whitney. <laughs> oh, goodness. Yeah, yeah. That that's was... okay. It's a, so that you go on the rotunda, but yeah. Yes, you're right. Beautiful visual. <laughs> All right, so. I think that's recounted in the in the interview 
uh, from the Brooklyn Rail, I believe, which uh, you can see the link in the chat to your right. So oh, great. Cool. I'll let you all go on. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Lola. Thank you. All right. So uh, to our next artist, superstar, Michaela Martello. <laughs> uh, so I'm just going to give you uh, a quick on the bio and try to really uh, dive into your work deep and hand it off to you, Michaela. So Michaela Martella was born in Italy, uh, Northern Italy, Grosseto. Um, she studied- oh. <laughs> South, okay, because your family's in Milano now. That's why I think that you were in the North. Um, studied illustration at the European Institute of Design in Milan and was an illustrator for children's books for 10 years, dividing her time between Milan and London. Um, this point is an interesting one, and you can even see it in Michaela's slide that's up here. The fact that she has that um, background in children's book illustration, I find is, even though it was sort of by accident, and Michaela could talk about that, that you studied illustration instead of painting, um, because of what was going on with revolution and counter-revolution in Italy at that time, but the fact that um, Michaela worked on children's books really gives her this incredible skill to take extremely heavy, heavy things of life, like existential matter that she's really pulling from all of the universe, from every religion, every background, and she adds like some sort of whimsy to it so that it makes it beautiful and digestible. I mean, that's something in a very different aesthetic way you and Lola actually have in common. Um, you know, you're really taking on something so thick and at the end of the artwork, the viewer is completely enchanted and captivated by the beauty first and foremost. And that's how you get them in to really um, tell the story that you're trying to tell. So, um, Michaela has exhibited widely throughout her career. She is um, in many public and private collections. She does mural outside work, as you can see with this mural that she did at Pen and Brush for her solo exhibition in 2017. Um, her work has, is, is in major collections such as Andrea Soros, the um, permanent collection of the Museum of Modern Art in Taiwan. She was also selected recently by Jerry Saltz to be in the New American Painting Magazine, issue number 146. And she shows regularly with the um, Giovanni Benelli Gallery in Milan, and she has a solo show coming up this fall there. So, um, Michaela, I will kick it to you at this point. Maybe you can talk a little bit, um, really, about whatever you want, but the mural and the mural and what you allowed people to do with it are the first slides that are up. <laughs> we, we had just a, a, a slight tech glitch, so the, okay. the images will be coming up in just a second. Cool. Thanks. But I can still talk about that mural. Um, as you, as you said, Don. Yeah, it's. Uh, I really wanted to study painting at the Academia of Brera after high school of art. But there were a lot of uh, riots, I would say, in that time in Milano. So I kept going to the office of the Academia, and it was always closed. And they kept telling me, "Come back the next day." And the final due day was kind of approaching. So I was risking to lose the year and then i said well i also love illustrations i love details and uh, anyway the office kept being closed so i couldn't enroll into the uh, painting program of academia of brera and i and i went to yed the institute europe institute of design and i took the course of illustrations and i worked as an illustrator for children's book for 10 years but my love was always towards painting so um so then I finally detached myself from illustrations, even though I keep that kind of uh, experience within my work and I was able to integrate it in a way that uh, at the beginning I felt it was a little bit uh, a conflict, but now it's super helpful. Mostly exactly for the reason that um, Don listed. So it's, um, when I painted this mural, it was for the, for the uh, show Future is Goddess. And uh, I wanted to, uh, Follow the concept of pen and brush and work on something that was super inclusive. But also we were at the moment where the, you know, the Me Too movement and um, 
and this uh, evolution of the, I would say, feminine energy was very um, tangible. So I wanted to work with something that was representing three women uh, seeing the world in a kind of uncomfortable position, but with a totally completely different point of view, like the opposite a little bit. And at the same time, I wanted this to be kind of fun because I thought this mural has to be an interactive mural. So I wanted people to be part of the mural, how? So just uh, inviting people to either write a statement regarding the, the concept of uh, feminine energy the, in the most open way. Um, I mean, it could have been political, it couldn't be spiritual, anything or even write a symbol, make a drawing on the wall. So being uh, within the, the mural in a very uh, active way and kind of charge it with electricity and um, uh, energy. So you can show that then what happened with the, I think it's the next uh, slide. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I should just mention that this show opened right um, after Trump was inaugurated. So um, the title when we were talking with Michaela, Future is Goddess, it was kind of a play on the term futurist female from the 70s. And once Trump got into office, we kind of made a joke that we need our full goddess power to kind of like answer this and rise above it and really give people something inspiring and cathartic to like let it out on this wall and interact with. So um, the timing of what was going on in the world um, was really important in the creation of this mural. Yeah. And also for me, it was important to train in permanence because um, they, I remember Parker and Don telling me, are you sure you want something like that? Because for sure there's gonna be some damage on the mural. And I said, of course, I mean, I, I, but I don't want to see this as a damage. I just, I'm trying to see this first as an exercise of on impermanence and that about, it, it, it has to be about integrating everything and then just let it go. So we had a lot of fun <laughs> uh, uh, taking part on this uh, wall of energy. Yeah. So that wall opened up to about a nine year survey of Michaela's work in the full space um, on both floors. So those are some of the next slides. Um, if you want to forward the slide and then Michaela, if you could take us through pointing out um, and talking about your body of work a bit. Um, okay, these two, uh, the slide, okay, these two slides, these slides has these uh, two portraits which are of the same uh, woman. Um, and it, this work is called uh, uh, Victim Survivor and I painted this on Bura. Bura, it's a, a rose silk uh, scarf that um, you can find Bura in, in Nepal, but mostly in Bhutan. And actually I was in Bhutan that year and I, and I, and I wanted to wear this Bura because I thought it's a beautiful scarf, but they told me that I couldn't and I was very curious. So they said that the Bura can be worn only by, only men can wear Bura. And usually they wear Buddha on a, during a ritual um, ceremony. So it's kind of a sacred uh, um, fabric that is being blessed. So he made it even more precious and the fact that only men could uh, wear this precious um, scarf, it, it kind of pissed, pissed me off a little bit. <laughs> I was like, I don't understand. I mean, we are in Bhutan and uh, uh, so we should, uh, it's a, it is a country where uh, women and, and men are very equal on so many different aspects, but at the same time, they are the opposite. So um, then I was uh, talking to a friend of mine who works at the United Nations, and she told me about uh, uh, how they used to refer to women, to battered women as victims, uh, many years ago, and then they had a study on the effect of the neuro language uh, therapy, uh, something called like that, that uh, uh, mm, according to what kind of name you address a person, a person already embodied that kind of energy. So they switched from victim to survivor, and they started to see how faster these battered women were recovering. 
from uh, any sort of uh, violence that was perpetrated to, to them. And so all of a sudden I had this vision of painting a portrait of a woman. Um, one was called uh, victim and the other one was called survive on Bura. And, and of course, when I showed this work to Pan and Brash, they were, they understood right away and they, they said, yeah, let's have it. Let's mm -hmm. have it in the show. So yeah, this is the story of victim and survival. If you want to add something, okay. <laughs> yeah, as Lala was saying before, having a solo at Pan and Brush, uh, and when they give you the first floor and the second floor, I mean, the, the, the street floor and the basement floor, it, it felt like, I remember when they, when they told me this, I said, well, usually I'm pretty um, well trained on uh, adjusting to bad news. And I have no idea how to adjust to this uh, new, you know, having a solo show with this amazing space. So um, on the, um, so this is a, again, another image at the Futurist Goddess. And this is something that I, I like to work with the theme of death uh, in, a, in, a, um, in a way that uh, it's kind of helping me and possibly help the viewer to overcome fear. So this is uh, something that I, uh, I worked on a very old field. On the backside of the field, uh, I painted the portrait of Isis. It's a little bit of Isis and Osiride, which it, they represent the myth of uh, bringing people back from uh, death. And then I, I painted on the backside, letting the green uh, pigment coming through the fabric and uh, showing on, on basically what I, what I painted, it's beyond, it's um, on the other side of this piece of fabric. And then it kind of passed through. And, and then what I see was like a manifestation of the goddess that can help us on the darkness of the passage from life to death. So we should mention that Michaela is, we call her like the queen of symbolism. Michaela uses symbolism in such an authentic way that doesn't appropriate um, cultures, but really um, it's more of an awareness almost in an activist way. And that's because of, as we were saying, her um, history with illustrating. Um, and so uh, in this piece, and then and I think the ones coming up, Michaela, maybe you can tell us a, a couple things about what some of the symbols mean and how they have what they mean to you you mean this one or the other one parker um i think this one would be great like um okay. the any any of them really but yeah um this one it's uh, the title is a uh, tiger nest and that again another um another inspiration that i took from bhutan because there's this um monastery in bhutan that is called tiger nest and uh, while i was uh, walking uh, while I was climbing up the mountain to reach this monastery, um, I must say that since I was a child, I, I was looking for a, a clover with four leaves that in Italy, but I, I guess everywhere I've been said that they bring very good luck, great luck. So maybe I was too focused on trying to find one and I never found one. And while I was walking, uh, climbing up this mountain, I was... Um, I was not really looking for that. Let's say I was already, I already gave up on find, finding a four leaves clover. And then all of a sudden I saw one and it was so beautiful. It was in front of me and I couldn't believe it. And then I was raising my head and I see the monastery of Tiger Nest, which is, for me was like a dream to, <laughs> to be there. So um, I didn't pick it, I left it there. And I felt, because there's some uh, saying about shamanism that uh, you, you have to enjoy nature as much as you can and take the energy of the nature, but uh, don't take everything from the roots. So uh, I felt like I should have left the, uh, the uh, clover there. And then I just, uh, and then I had this uh, amazing experience while I was in a monastery. They gave me the inspiration for this painting. And uh, as, as Nick before said, and I, I like when you, in, when you were doing the introduction, introduction and then you said something about mystery. So there are things <laughs> that even for me are a mystery. I have some vision and uh, I, 
I used to try to understand exactly what they meant. And then my painting didn't flow as much as I wanted. And then when I finally started to let this vision come and not trying to understand it from a rational point of view, what they exactly mean, the, the painting was flowing like, um, uh, like without any, any, um, any obstacles, almost, because we always create some obstacles to ourselves. And, uh, and for me, a little bit, what I can say about this one is that I think it has to do about duality and the fact that I was in Bhutan at the Tiger Nest Monastery, where um, it's the monastery of Guru Padma Sambhava, which is uh, this Indian prince that brought uh, Buddhism in Tibet. Yeah? So it's a place where they work on duality, trying to include every opposite manifestation of reality. So that's how I, I was, you know, I wanted to paint something that was related with duality, but at the same time, back and forth, back and fr um, in front of the same person, it kind of creates the, the hole. And, uh, and the umbilical cord, it's related to the source of uh, life, which, is, which at that moment for me was represented by water. And- <laughs> Can yeah. you talk about the use of the army sack, Michaela, and your relationship with our pulvera? Yes, um, okay. Let's say sometimes the inspiration also comes just from a uh, um, material that I use. Like I see a piece of fabric and it, that gives me the idea for the next work. So I, then I started to think that um, because I, usually what I like are vintage fibers and fabric and textiles, I felt this material carries a lot of memories. That's why it inspires me so much especially this um, um, American vintage uh, US Army. And then every time I work on this material, the American US Army, I always, always, always paint female subject. And since this fabric I used, some of these were used at the Second World War, I felt like, um, I, I don't know, I kind of, it, that during war soldiers were kind of completely detached by the uh, feminine principle which uh, let's say like a, you, you want to have a hug from your mother you want to be protected instead you are at war you have no uh, shelter you have to be very brave and it, that's why I started to think probably I'm trying to compensate this kind of memory this kind of vibration and also um, it's a uh, Let's say it's also a way of purifying some very heavy memories. Yeah. I love the way that you let the materials that you use react in the way that they do. And you can see that here as well. You let paint come through you sometimes. What it, remember that one work? And we were like, how did you get this texture? How did you get it? It looked almost dirty, but it was treated in this really expert kind of way. And you were like, oh, I, I tied it behind my car and we ran over it a couple of times. <laughs> and I, I couldn't get over that because the work looked like such high art that had to have been treated through some technical skill learned at this. And, you know, um, but you, you do that, you experiment, you allow yourself to, but then you also do use really high, you know, art technical um, uh, painting techniques in your work and you also allow yourself which is one of my favorite things to experiment with material you're not tied to a certain texture a certain you're not even tied to a certain um, medium I mean your sculptures have been so good but also um, you you let paint and you sometimes use graphite with paint and you sometimes even sand off a gesso yeah. which I think is really cool and in the works before, you're, I think you're always also thinking about your history. I don't want to speak for you, but you're, you, I know that we talk a lot about fresco um, and, and the effect that how you make your painting look like fresco, which is so cool because fresco is notoriously difficult. Um, and, it, you know, historically it dries very quickly on the wall um, and artists had a, a terrible time correcting any of their mistakes or changing anything. And so um, with you, it's very changed, very fluid, but yet it still has that effect. And this I just love. So anyway, go ahead. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, mostly by accident. 
you know, when, <laughs> when, a, when a fabric, when a textile really works, it's either because I've done something uh, uh, without a specific purpose or because it, um, it's been done not by me, but by someone else, I would say. So that, that again is another memory that I like to include, integrate with my work. And I think the, you know, the way that um, what Parker was saying, how you um, morph and adapt m materials that we expect to be fine art, the history of materials, it's really the same philosophy that you're using with symbols that you take from across cultures and cr across religions. And they're all sort of dancing and communicating on the surface of your canvases without judgment. Um, you know, and with respect to, to what they really mean to try to communicate almost a universal language and feeling to the viewer um, to, yeah. again, yeah. digest some heavy things, um, which I know in, in a few of the slides we're getting to the amazing works you've been creating during isolation and quarantine that um, take on the intensity of what everyone's been going through. And um, so I don't if we Maybe we flip through to those, Michaela, and sure. go to the Tara image. Because yeah. um, I just want to also point out with uh, Michaela's family being in Milan, and we all know how hard Italy was hit with the pandemic. Um, and that's how we kind of knew what was coming towards us here in New York. Michaela was here in New York, but she was really getting personal firsthand um, insights from her family about how bad the pandemic was before it got to us here. And you can really see that um, in some of the early work that she was creating in March. Yes, I think it's uh, not this one. So, if you get forward the next, there yeah. we go. Yeah. Right. Yes, I was uh, in contact with my family, my mother, my sister, some friends. My cousin, which is a neurosurgeon, he was uh, at the COVID intensive care in North Italy. So one of the hospitals that was most heated. So I would say at least a month before that it kind of really heated here. And uh, so it was that very difficult to adjust, I guess, for like for everybody. Adjust to what, what happened in China and then in Italy, but still you don't think that it's going to happen here. It's like, uh, okay, you maybe can predict on a, a rational way that a way of thinking that maybe it's going to happen here, but you don't know until you you're, do the experience with your senses, what it, what it is really. So um, when he had, thank God nothing happened to my family, but it was, it was intense, it was very sad. And the, the lockdown was mandatory in Italy. So my, my mother, for instance, she's 82 years old and she couldn't leave the house for almost four months. So, yeah, they found, they found, a lot of Italians found they had a lot of resources in the lockdown. Well, anyway, then when it happened here, I wanted to, um, I wasn't panicking, but I started to have fear, uh, fear of dying, like, I guess, everybody. And uh, I wanted to adjust, to transform this kind of emotion. I didn't want, I mean, I wanted to be centered and observe this emotion. And the support of my practice, Tibetan Buddhism, was super helpful and still it is because it helped me to have the experience of fear of death without being overwhelmed. Not that I overcame that fear, of course, but I was, you know, the first thing that came to me was the fear of uh, how we are, at, we have this strong attachment that is related with our body. So the fact that uh, the, the dress of, this woman, which is Tara, is made of uh, chopped parts of our body, arms and legs. It was cathartic in a way to start to work on the uh, detachment uh, sensation. And then when you start to work on the detachment sensation of the body, at, at one point you ask to yourself, and what it is left? So you keep feeling the onion. And then it felt like uh, the principle of compassion was very strong. And Tara, she's the goddess of compassion. She's an excel, excellent lady. She has amazing tools and she's, uh, she helps everyone, regardless uh, our background. In, she helps murder and saints. So she's comprehensive of every manifestation of reality. At that point, it, it felt like uh, one of the biggest uh, tools 
to help me to accept and adjust to what was happening and, and have her as a companion and protector because the more I kind of uh, observed fear of that, the more I felt that it wasn't really about me, but it was about everybody. And there were people that were really experiencing super heavy and terrible moments, like having death in their family of being in the hospital with the ventilator. So all of a sudden you snap out of yourself and you start to feel uh, the community in a real sense, in a very compassionate sense. So that's why I'm saying Tara, she's amazing. She's super powerful. And, uh, and also, I don't know for which reason, I had in my head this vision of a woman wearing a crown since a year ago. And so that's how she manifested. Oh, and this one is another one that it was really still, I mean, related with the process of that, I would say. This one is called Rainbow Body. And Rainbow Body is, uh, well, I don't know if I can get into the explanation of what Rainbow Body is, but let's say just with a few, because I'm not sure I can do it, but if in a few words, um, well, on a very higher level of meditation, uh, during the experience of death, the body disappears and what is left uh, is usually air and um, nails and teeth. So um, having said that, this painting had, again, it was for me very helpful in order to uh, process the idea of death. And I painted this one right after um, I heard the news where I, I guess was the day after the which uh, the highest number of death was in New York State. And that night I was really feeling very, very nervous and uh, I, I was shaking and, uh, and so it, it was very important for me to try again to observe what was going to happen. And being within ourselves in that time, because no one really, we, we really had to be um, uh, inside in a way, it was very hard to communicate and to be social. So to, to look um, towards my uh, deepest fear and try to transform this with this painting, it was kind of, um, it allowed me to uh, discover another dimension a little bit. So when, when the body dissolves, what it, when we all die, we, f we kind of dissolve to the five elements. And the first one that goes away is earth. And earth is the one that creates a lot of attachment for us because with our body, we grasp to be attached to earth. And after uh, the dissolution of the earth element is the water element and then the fire element, the um, air element and the space element. And after that is the subtle mind. And um, so it's, uh, it's like when you, when you can kind of purify your heavy karmic uh, experience through this life and let go and allow your subtle mind to, to find a new body for the next reincarnation. So in a way, I think it's a beautiful process and, uh, and it kind of brings us back to the fact that we shouldn't really really be so afraid of that but that uh, requires a lot of uh, deep thinking and practicing and then quickly let's just go to the next one and just quickly talk about that i mean this is so great and this is another example of you working with different material and letting the material kind of do its thing but also this is kind of a different work this is a new work so if we can just quickly so we can get time for uh questions but i, I think this is just great Right, okay, well, this, we go back about the mystery. <laughs> it's a mystery to me, this one. I, would, I painted this one right after a um, uh, walk in the woods and there were all these, I was looking at the, um, at the soil and I see all these leaves and all of a sudden it felt like a river and it felt like I was part of this river and the leaves we, were all like, uh, um, a, again, a community that we were kind of going somewhere without knowing where. So all of a sudden I thought this moment, it's really a big training to the unknown because nobody knows what's going to happen. We all felt like 
we, we want to have an answer to this. We want to, you know, you, when you want to take shelter to someone that's going to tell you, don't worry, it's going to be fine because of this and this and this. No, nobody knew. So um, it, it's the unknown, I would say. Yeah. Oh, this one, yeah, I love this. Right, this one, it's, uh, th this is one of the most recent, and uh, even though there's still so many unknown things that are around us regarding the future, I had a dream. I, I had a dream that it was very much like this vision, and I just wanted to paint exactly what I, what I dreamed. The fact that air were coming out from my armpit, um, I'm not sure what it means, but I know that when you dream airs, it has to do with a big life change and growth. So it, it felt like maybe something that would make me feel uncomfortable will happen, but at the same time, it signifies, I hope, growth, evolution, and uh, um, presenting myself in a way that uh, even though it can, it's uh, uncomfortable, it's, um, it's a sign of movement. I wasn't let's say I wasn't froze by fear or by, or by um, uh, not knowing what's going to happen in the future. Yeah, absolutely. It's also a very open position. All right, but let's keep going to the next one so we can, so people can see that. Um, uh, this one again is painted on, um, uh, I don't know how this is called in, uh, in English. We call it Gette. This belongs still to the Second World War. I think they were French. And the, this is two pieces of different fabric that I put it together. And during oh, of course that. No? You put, you put, a soldier used to put this on top of their boots. Oh, okay. Someone, someone just wrote in corset, so I was wondering. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yes, and the, the, but the way that I hanged it, um, the way that I installed it, it, it wanted to um, to represent something more feminine. It, it could be like a, a, a skirt, it could be like a um, corset, how you call it? Yeah. The one that, when you pull the string and makes uh, your chest kind of tiny. tiny. And uh, so again, I, I wanted to work with the uh, feminine element, but not really in what I painted, but in the shape of something that was supposed, meant to be something completely different. And um, one of my biggest uh, uh, figure of inspirations is Giotto. Uh, Giotto and, and uh, Fresco, as you mentioned before, Parker, and also the, I mean, Italian frescoes and the um, Tibetan frescoes from the monastery, which actually happened in the same uh, 15th, uh, uh, 1400, same time, of, but from, to different completely parts of the world. So there is a, um, uh, the, 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 um, I would say this one would want to represent uh, something that evoke an offering. Like it, it, this was done right before the end of the worst phase in Italy, but I didn't know it was the end. So it felt like uh, um, the Italian, Italian roots were the one that probably helped Italy to uh, overcome the dark, darkness period. And uh, we all kind of went back to something that it's very simple. It's not just the, uh, an Italian table, but it's just the basics, basic needs for our uh, day-to-day -day life, water, bread, but something very simple. So if, if we kind of, at least for me, if we keep some uh, simple vision, it's easier to uh, readapt to whatever has the future for us to come. All right, so now let's go to Lola and we'll just talk about your work that you're doing quickly um, in quarantine, which is just so important. I mean, I hate to say quickly, but I know we got to keep a time here. But um, so go, I'm going to just let Lowell take it away. I mean, he's, oh. Um, yes. Thanks, everyone, for hanging in there. Um, so when um, 
you know, I suppose sort of echoing what, how Michaela was feeling. Um, in fact, I remember talking to you, Michaela, at that show that we had at Pen and Brush organized downtown and you were sort of giving us like the inside scoop about um, what was going on in Italy. Um, so like many people, you know, I was kind of frozen that first month. I was, first of all, I was teaching. I'm also a high school teacher in Brooklyn. Uh, and um, so we were thrown into, like all the teachers, thrown into doing online teaching, you know, like, okay, you, here's three days now, teach. Um, so that was kind of my daytime thing. And then, you know, I was just really exhausted and scared. And, you know, I, I live in Manhattan. So where I live, it's kind of still kind of busy on the streets, even though we were, you know, in lockdown, supposedly. Um, and so for the first month, I was really stuck. And then I, you know, then I was like, you know, I have a pretty good view. So I was always sticking my head out the window and looking and hardly seeing any cars and anyone who was in the city or probably any of the bigger cities because it's kind of similar here in London now. But um, I started thinking, you know, I should really take advantage of this quiet city. Um, so I had started this self-portrait project, which is basically about Afrofuturism and um, quickly thinking about, my explanation is quickly, is quick. So thinking about what black and brown what black and brown lives are going to look like in the future. So since we didn't get a chance to write our histories, we're going to be able to to write our futures. And who doesn't want to be happy, right? We, as much as black and brown people have gone through, I think some people might think that we like not being happy, but we don't. <laughs> um, and so um, I had started this character Syzygy uh, last summer at the Center for Photography of Woodstock, and I thought you know, Syzygy, you know, my avatar should, should come alive, should be in this. So I, I thought I should start documenting them. So as I'm talking, maybe if whoever's turning the slides can maybe turn the slide now. Um, so yeah, I took advantage of like iconic places like obviously Grand Central Station, um, you can keep going, um, sort of the flag. Um, and then um, you know, I went to Times Square and actually it was not as quiet as I thought it was going to be. So I kind of opted for standing on this, this uh, sort of platform where I could sort of not, where we couldn't see the people. Um, and this is mimicking the 1968, because um, I felt like I was like on a sort of um, Olympics kind of platform. And so I, I just sort of uh, struck this pose that was from that iconic 1968 Olympic um, fist pump um, and you can keep going. Okay, so then um, then poor Mr. George Floyd was, was killed as we all know and the city just erupted, you know, and although there were some places that were kind of were, were still quiet, I felt like it was a lie. And my, you know, I was hearing the whir whirring of the helicopter, uh, the sirens going by and I was, it was kind of making me nervous. I lived by myself and um, I started taking walks and I, you know, I said, okay, you've done all your, your um, uh, active activism. You don't need to be in the streets with these kids, you know, but I kept bumping into them on my walks home, you know, here they are actually, I just wanted to, to say here they are actually learning sign language. Um, and these are some of the stories that you don't see. And I just thought it was amazing just to see, you know, the breadth of the, the different kinds of people that are there and the fact that they were learning how to uh, to bla uh, sign Black Lives Matters, which I think is something like this, this and this, something like that. And um, F-U-C-K, the cops, <laughs> one of the two things that they were learning. You can keep going. So, but as you, as you turn, also that the fact that the younger generation are even in their demonstrations are thinking about accessibility is really so important. You know, I think for my generation, it was kind of like an after afterthought, but they're right on the ground doing it. This one I thought was really kind of um, says it all really. Here we have a black man on crutches, you know, um, someone that kind of represents our community, but we're still standing you know, still fighting the good fight. Uh, you can keep going. Yeah, I think that was the same demonstration. Um, I loved all the um, handmade um, signs 
And it's interesting to look at this work because this is my, I, I suppose you would call it my documentary work. It's not something that I really ever sort of have um, really shown in a proper way. Um, but uh, Art News had reached out to me and asked me what, what, what I was doing around the, um, the, the um, around this, this climate. And uh, they asked me to, to, you know, I actually said, well, I have some work about, you know, for my Syzygy um, series, and I've got some sort of documentary stuff. Can I put them together? And so they were happy to, to let me tell that story. Um, you can keep going. But I did actually sneak in a few of the quiet ones. So here's, here's Syzygy at a demonstration in Harlem. Um, is that the last slide of mine? Yeah. 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 So, so, so yeah, so I mean, it was, you know, kind of went full circle. And to be honest with you, I did kind of cheat. And uh, since I knew I was coming to London, I, I did shoot a few like quiet scenes, like in um, the, the meatpacking district and a couple of other places where it was still quiet. And I didn't actually feel like, I felt, feel like I was cheating. You know, after I shot, I was just like, Lola, th 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 there are actual areas that are quiet. So it's no sort of, you know, I didn't want to like dishonor all the people that have been killed. Um, because that wasn't the sort of sentiment of the whole world, but there still were quiet areas I wanted to get before I, I came over here. Um, so thank you. Well, thank you, Lola, very much. Um, I'm gonna jumpstart the Q&A section because I noticed someone asked, uh, how is Pen and Brush planning to manifest its full goddess powers this fall? Um, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so I, I can at least let that question be answered here with a couple of upcoming projects. But I, again, I want to thank you, Lola and Michaela, so thank much. You. And thank I love you. that. I love that image that had uh, the sign with the, the, the person with the sign that, that said that we're resilient, because it's amazing to see the work that we're looking at now in this trajectory of, you know, starting in 1894 and this small clubhouse of women uh, in the 20s and beyond. And um, it's wonderful to see that where Pen and Brush is now and the kind of work that's being made now. So I, again, just want to thank all of you. And I also want to encourage everyone to read that Artonic profile written by Alex A. Jones in The Rail and to check out Pen and Brush's website. Um, so Don, yeah, if you want to just go over some of these details, I, we have time for maybe two questions and then we will cap it off with a poem. Sure. So, um... When we open in September to December, as it's uh, listed here, we really just want to be focusing on uh, artist work that was created from this period of March till now. So uh, some of Lola's pieces and Michaela's that you've seen that were recent will be rotating in on view throughout the fall and winter. Um, and Everything's for sale, we should say. We haven't said yes. that yet. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, Parker. So our, our equity market-based objectives, all work is always for sale. 75% goes straight to the artist. 25 comes oh, back and feed the organization. So um, we also launched an initiative that Parker headed up 200 or less on Artsy since we knew during quarantine, a lot of our uh, very emerging collectors um, at lower price points were furloughed as well, working in museums and such. So uh, we really wanted our artists who were furloughed from their day jobs or waitressing or bartending to have some sort of income while they were sorting out unemployment and things of that nature. So they started creating works from home at $200 or less that we were selling and still are selling on Artsy. So when we reopen, there'll be a continuing exhibition with this topic of from isolation to revolution, to rebirth, to dissent, thinking sort of about what we're heading into in November um, and giving artists a, a place for, for everything that they need to, to reflect on and exercise through their works. We'll be having that exhibit rotate and we'll also have affordable art goods for sale in the physical space as well as on our Artsy account, so. And Michaela um, Martello will also have um, her first, well, not her first, the first solo show of a woman artist at Giovanni Benelli Gallery in Milan um, in October, uh, which we're very excited about. Dawn and I are actually lucky enough to be able to curate that show and the gallery has been amazing and we're, we love Giovanni Benelli. Um, so we're very excited about that. Go ahead, Dawn. Yes. So yes, and we, we also have um, some tremendous exhibitions here that were displaced by COVID. Um, 
Deborah Jack, a solo exhibition. There's a uh, work in the top corner of Deborah's, a 15 year survey. So we're working on rescheduling that as well as the identity show with Bina Sarker. So, um, you know, stay tuned to our website. You can find Parker and myself very easily um, if you have any questions, but I know Nick, you wanted to uh, go through a few questions from the audience first. Sure. Well, um, I want to encourage everyone, if you want to, you can always download the chat, which is that dot, dot, dot over there. Uh, there have been lots of links, including most recently, there's the artsy link to that show that you can support Pen & Brush now and into the future. Um, that said, uh, I do want to take just a couple of questions. We have much, many, many, many that we aren't going to be able to get to, but I want to thank everyone for sending in questions directly to us. Um, but the first question is, I don't know your name individually, but uh, the user, the resort LIC asked a question. Um, so resort Long Island City, I assume. Uh, I am going to pass the mic over to you and you can ask your question. Can you hear us? Oh yeah, hey, sorry, I didn't realize it was gonna be. Audio. This is Catherine Losota. It is Long Island City. I, I run a writer space here called The Resort, and I realized I logged in on that account. <laughs> well, welcome. Welcome. Thank you for your questions. Yeah, of course. Um, Michaela, I actually had the pleasure of interviewing several years ago when that exhibit was up for electric literature, and we talked about the connection oh, sure. between... Hi. Hi, <laughs> Catherine. Nice to see you. Hi. Nice to see you guys. You Hope too. you're hanging in okay. Um, we had the pleasure of talking about uh, text and images in Michaela's work, and I wondered if Michaela could speak briefly to choices of, um, there, was, there was a lot of discussion of symbolism and use of symbols in Michaela's work and the choice of um, what kind of, of words might be combined in the choices of combining text with symbols um, across languages, across different cultures, et cetera. Um, and that's the question. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes, I remember that interview it was great. Thank you so much. Um, well, it's a uh, the uh, the more I paint, the less I want to create any restriction. I learned that the more I keep it open and um, and I trust the process, then I also find amazing uh, fabric and textiles that are super inspiring and. So I really try to be inclusive, and that goes very well with the pen and brush. <laughs> um, regarding the symbols, there are a lot of symbols that belong to the philosophy and uh, practice that I study since many years. Uh, it's uh, Tibetan Buddhism, and uh, it's, uh, it's amazing. There are so many symbols also that belong to the previous period, the Bon or Shamanism. So, I, sometimes I don't really want to understand the symbol, but if it speaks to me and it goes inside myself, I know that it works on a subconscious level, exactly as symbols should do. And it doesn't happen just uh, to me, it happens to everybody. So it can, we can kind of um, understand a little bit of symbols through our dreams sometimes, or you can have an, uh, an epiphany all of a sudden. And I wanted to keep it that way. So the choice that uh, lead me to the um, certain symbols is completely dictated by a spontaneous process. Because now I trust myself more than I used to trust myself in the past. So let's say that if I choose a symbol, I'm pretty sure that that symbol is gonna work. And sometimes I discover that the symbol belongs to a, to a religion or a, culture that is completely unknown to me. And that's the beauty of the, of kind of trying to create a universal language through symbol and through uh, fabrics that comes from many, or any kind of material from different parts of the world. I used to include language two words, um, not now, but I don't know exactly why. I just, maybe I'll go back to, to language too. It's just that, um, I really try to respect myself now in a way that I wanted to be more um, spontaneous. Did I answer? Um, I can, I say, so. can, I, can I say something Please. about symbols too? Because I, um, you know, I was thinking too about this idea that Michaela is saying about, you know, universal, universal language because 
I mean, that's one of the things I love about art uh, and music too, you know, that it's anyone can really enjoy it. You know, uh, you don't have to, well, especially for art, you don't have to understand the language. Leading from music, right? You, you can like a tune, you don't know what the heck they're saying. Um, but with my Syzygy Syz character, you know, I'm, I'm wearing the, um, a prison outfit um, and I have the handcuffs on, you know, the, the astronaut or, uh, helmet. There are all these symbols that are speaking about, you know, the astronaut uh, helmet speaks to the future. You know, the, I'm very um, just consumed by the incarceration system in America and the, the sort of just uh, the, the rate that it is growing. Uh, I couldn't even finish watching the film 13th. Um, it was just too, it's just too much. So I use those symbols now because right now I'm not quite ready to get to this place where I talked about earlier about having this happy future. Um, but eventually I do see myself, like maybe the, it's gonna be a hundred portraits and I do see myself, you know, jumping from planet to planet, you know, in utter, you know, jubilation. Um, but right now I, I, I am feeling still very grounded and um, just, you know, am I gonna be next? Are they gonna shoot me next? You know, I mean, it's, it's real. Yeah. Well, thank you, Catherine, for that question, Michaela, for your answer, and Lola for taking it. I think we have time just for one more. And again, thank you to everyone that sent them in. I, um, I can forward some of the questions to our participants, and maybe we can have some answers in the future. But um, Lola, this kind of addresses what you're, you're talking about. And um, our last question comes from our very own John here at The Rail. Give me just a moment. Well, JC, I believe you can unmute yourself. Yeah, I'm here. Can I work? Okay, yes. Cool, cool. Um, well, well, Michaela, thank you so much for um, for chatting and, and Don mm -hmm. as well. It's been great. Um, and well, I had the pleasure of um, editing a studio visit with you earlier in quarantine. Um, and you were, you, you mentioned that you were, after you filmed, you were gonna run off back down to Union Square to, to take some of the Syzygy pictures. And um, I guess I'm just curious, like, if you could talk a bit about what creative activism means to you um, and kind of how you, how you, I think that's how you nurture that in your practice and how you think about it kind of changing um, over the years. Good question. Well, yeah, it is a good question. I mean, I think that as someone who is been shooting for a long time that it, it has changed over my sort of lifetime. Um, initially, I used to photograph a lot of demonstrations uh, that ACT UP was doing. And then I would change them into, using my cross color, I would change them into these kind of crazy apocalyptic looking skies and things. Um, now I think that now I believe my work is, is a little bit more direct. And again, thinking about the way that Mikel is talking, um, you know, uh, you, you get to this point where we've gotten to this point where we uh, um, understand our tools and our symbols and all the kinds of great things that um, I, you know, I love school. So a lot of the great things that I learned in my foundation classes in, in, at Maryland Institute of Art. Um, so that I'm able to use all of those things to, to create um, to create those dialogues. So um, I'm feeling the Syzygy, the vision um, series a lot. And I think for, for many of us too, many of us artists, probably some of you out there, um, on the, whatever you're working on, like is kind of like the thing that you're most excited about. But also I think I'm excited about it because it hits on all the different, so many of the different things that I've been working on my whole life. Um, so I, I suppose really just a simple answer is I just, just keep be, keeping creating images that will make people stop, um, images that aren't on the front covers of Vogue and Vanity Fair, um, and just keep putting those images out there and hoping that in some ways, I mean, in some ways hoping that it gets out there, um, definitely, this is why coming back to pen and brush, why 
it was so important for, for them to, to see my work. And they'll always say, well, Lola, you make great work, which I do. But <laughs> if, if my work is under my bed, then who, who's going to see it, you know? So it has to be this kind of two-way street. And it has to be, um, you know, what I want to see going forward is that, you know, we cultures do things differently, right? Foods smell differently. There's like things uh, feel different, right? There's all these different things that are cultural. And so we need to make sure that we're opening up the art world so that people that look like me, maybe their lines are going to be a little bit different. Maybe their brush strokes are going to be, not even maybe they will be, right? So, you know, you don't go into, I don't know, you don't go into a South African restaurant and expect the, re the food to taste like French food. You know what I mean? So we need to sort of like make sure that we're being inclusive, in, even in that, in the sort of aesthetic of the way art is. Right, absolutely. Can I say something related to the picture you showed us before, uh, the picture of the 30s, that the, what has been done with pen and brush that brought me and Lola together with pen and brush, just, you know, having, keeping this perspective and seeing where we are now, it is amazing. It feels just incredible that we are here, we can see that picture and they brought us together. Yeah, once you're, once you're in there, they never let you go. So that's <laughs> really, it's, 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 it's great, right, Michaela? I mean, you feel like you always, it's like, uh, it feels like I'm going home when I go to the gallery, you know? It's like, I always leave there with my heart feeling like, like that. Uh, yeah, 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 they, they, they really know what support means in the real way, no matter what. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm gonna I, say thank you, Lola. Yeah, thank you, yes. Michaela. Thank you, Michaela. As a transition. <laughs> sorry, I'm. I, what were you saying, Don? I, I talked over someone. Sorry. Okay. Uh, we have this inside joke that Lola always tells us that the people at Pen and Brush never say thank you. So I'm gonna <laughs> be mindful of that and thank you back. And um, you know, it's. It's, it's our honor as art historians and uh, carers of culture and change and revolution to carry this torch um, ever stronger together, um, as Fong says, in solidarity. Forward. Thank you to the rail for having us. Yes. 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 Thank you, thank you well, all. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Lola, Michaela, Don, Parker. This has been a wonderful conversation. I'm so proud that uh, our organization can collaborate with you on um, uh, with this Artonic profile, and also here today just to have a conversation about you know your your history, your future, and um, what's coming up for you. Um, as I kind of started talking about that long title, so the the, the second part of it was uh, rebirth and descent. So um, hopefully we all continue the descent, moving towards November third. Uh, but as we typically end all of our lunch conversations with a poem, we can maybe go towards the, the rebirth aspect now. Um, Fanny, I'm going to briefly introduce you and then uh, I'll pass the mic off over to you. Thank you for being so patient with us. Um, so a quick introduction of Fanny. Fanny Howe has been living in New England for many years and before that she was in California. In between, she goes to Ireland, where she stays in a Benedictine monastery in Limerick. She has written many novels, including Radical Love, a collection published by Nightboat Books, and several books of poetry. The most recent is Love and I from Grey Wolf, and she has been awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship, the Lenan Award for Lifetime Achievement, and several other awards for her poetry, fiction, and essays. She is Professor Emerita in Literature from UC San Diego. So Fanny, welcome so much. Thank you for being here today. And um, I will pass the mic off. Let's make sure, just a moment. Mic, mic issue, just one moment. You should see a prompt on your screen to, to unmute. Are you able to, if you, oh, I think you're there. Ah, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. My God, what a wonderful conversation that was. <laughs> Thank you. The articulation of these two genius women. So moving. 
Poets don't know how to talk like that. <laughs> I'm going to read a poem from my book that uh, is called Second Childhood. The Monk and Her Seaside Dreams. The monk is a single, and so am I. But which kind? All of them, from young to wild, and the boyish one, mine, cared for the weak until there was no one to care for him, besides an old woman who lived as a she. I became a penitent sequentially, first in sandals, then in boots, then with a hood and bare feet, now nightbound, now nude, then old. Another brother and I took a train with a view of mountains floating in water out of Limerick Junction to Houston Station where Wittgenstein tried to discover emotion. He hit a horizon. Philosophy should only be written as poetry. Kind of just... I hauled so many children after me with ropes and spears and nets like sea creatures that others would eat. Without them, I have no purpose. As in the gospel account, I believed in their belief. But now there would be what? For he, the little one, was kneeling and saying, you must run. The lover I still loved stayed near the door. So I raced off. You stood when the police came, seeking coherence in everything. The total machine of retribution presses on, regardless of a prayer or what a person did. This is incredible. We are breaking up. Back there is the string of mountains your uncle painted and you lost. Out there is the clotted cream on a raspberry tart that he couldn't finish. There is the goose and the blackbird, the brindled donkey and the trap. They stand on the thin black thread of your lineage. Your scissors are split, your fiddle is cracked, its strings are thin, and your mouth is dry, your clothes American. No more rush of notes as if a window is open inside. Only if you are insane or asleep and the gods and animals pound their way in on a divine night wind. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fanny. There is a grid and wall of people clapping and applauding. And if we were in a real room, I'm sure it would be deafening. <laughs> Thank you so much, Fanny. Thank you so much, Lola, Michaela, Dawn, uh, Parker. Thank you, Pen and Brush, for your 125 years of resiliency and perseverance. Um, we're so thrilled to be able to be working together with you here and we are so thrilled to be able to end with a poem from Fanny. Uh, so to, you know, um, in saying philosophy should be written as poetry and the many mysteries that we kind of touched on with Michaela, um, I'm very, very happy to have had this space with all of you today. Uh, please join us every day as much as you can at 1 p.m. We do this every day at 1. Tomorrow, we are thrilled to be joining Eric Fischel and Phyllis Tuckman. So if you are around, please come in. Um, and with that, I would like to say uh, you can all unmute, or I'm sorry, you can activate your microphones and say goodbye as you leave. And in the spirit of mysteries, I wish you all a happy new moon in July. So I think you all should be able to. So is it, is it possible? Thank you, Nick. Thanks, Don. Bye. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Fanny. Thanks, Lola. Thank bye, bye. Thanks, Parker. Thanks, everybody. Stay safe. Thanks, Don. Thanks, Stay Michaela. Safe, everyone. Thanks, Lola. Thanks, Parker. <laughs> Thanks Thank for you, everyone sticking Don. around. What a beautiful poem, Fanny.